that the ultra-left is on the retreat. Mr. Ben said the election was worthwhile, it had given people hope. Our first report is from our chief political correspondent, John Harrison. It was a massive victory, and Neil Kinnock and Roy Hattersley will now use the result as a mandate to move Labour, no doubt with some opponents kicking and screaming, in the direction they think necessary to enhance the party's election prospects. It was a contest Mr Kinnock had called futile and selfish. He believed Tony Benn certainly stood no chance of winning, and that all those who challenged the leadership were concerned more with egos, less with taking on Mrs Thatcher. We want to use this great victory, for it is a great victory, given to us by this party to secure the greater victory, victory at the next general election. That is what we are dedicated to doing, determined to do. The leadership needed to do more than just win. It had to secure a convincing vote of confidence, and it did. In the event, the unions turned heavily against Tony Benn, virtually ignoring him. Voting by MPs highlighted Mr. Benn's isolation at Westminster. They backed Mr. Kinnock five to one. Out in the constituencies where Mr. Benn had expected most support, it was the same story, five to one. And the overall result to emerge from Labour's electoral college was just 11% for Mr. Benn, 89 for Mr. Kinnock, a massive vote of confidence. It is an extremely satisfying result, most of all because it very certainly is a direct mandate for unity and for change. Mr. Benn had accused the Kinnock leadership of sacrificing true socialism to suit Mrs. Thatcher's agenda. He's accustomed to being defeated, ignored even, but that hasn't and it won't stop him fighting, as he sees it, for the soul of the Labour Party. Well, I think being a democratic party, you don't just elect a leader and let him do what he wants. We have a thing called a party conference, which is meeting at the moment, where there will be votes on all the questions. And we shall have to see by the end of the week what the decisions are on these matters. Neil Kinnock's ability to fight off Mr. Benn was never in doubt, but more important for the credibility of the dream ticket was by what margin Roy Hattersley would beat John Prescott. It was convincing. The unions ignored Eric Heffer and backed Mr. Hattersley four to one against Mr. Prescott. MPs' loyalties divided almost equally between Eric Heffer and John Prescott, but Mr. Hattersley took the lion's share. And in the constituencies, Mr. Prescott again beat off Eric Heffer, but with Mr. Hattersley well ahead. The overall result, Roy Hattersley keeps the number two job with nearly 67% of the vote. I don't believe the party would forgive them. If having had this turbulence for six months, having had the diversion from the real job for six months, and then been beaten pretty thoroughly, I mean nine to one and three to one, if they were to start all this again with the damage it does to the party, I think it would be the people out there, the card-holding members of the party, who would be far more angry about it than I would. Well, we've had the result. I'm pleased with the level of support that I've received in today's deputy leadership contest. We fought a good campaign. John Prescott saw himself as the campaigner with close links with the rank and file. But the leadership dismissed him as a troublemaker who, by his challenge, was undermining the party's public standing. Tonight came words of reconciliation. The party has made a democratic decision. That's for all of us now to observe that decision, and get behind the leadership to beat Thatcher at the next general elections. That's what I intend to do in the shadow cabinet in the future. When Mr. Kinnock's no personal fear, standing in the polls is low, with voters no questioning his credentials for becoming Prime Minister. But more than once, fear. he's had to prove his willingness to tackle problems within his own party, the like this afternoon when faced with hecklers. I will have order. I won't have chanting. This is a democratic party. You will act democratically. Mr. Kinnock and Mr. Hattersley can afford to feel pleased with themselves tonight, with one contest well and truly won. But before the next election, there are battles still to be fought over key policy issues. The party badly needs cash and new members. But most important of all, it needs a huge shift in public opinion if the Kinnock Hattersley ticket is to become more than just a dream. And the policy reviews conducted by senior members of Labour's shadow cabinet will be debated at the conference this week. Now Mr Kinnock's got the result he wanted, he can begin shaping the future direction of the party. Our political editor, John Cole, reports. The belief in the conference lobbies tonight is that Neil Kinnock and Roy Hattersley will take this overwhelming victory as authority for a revolution within the Labour Party. 
This conference opens the second and more crucial year of their policy review. They'll hope to leave Blackpool still free of the handcuffs that hostile resolutions would clamp on these reviews. An influential ally sounded positive about the future. Neil Kennedy and Roy Hattersley command the broad support of the movement. And if we're talking about winning the next election, that's the leadership team that we want. The Shadow Cabinet has a tough year ahead. John Smith, who's a political bruiser, is savaging the economic record of a Chancellor who, for the first time, looks vulnerable. But he himself needs a popular tax policy. His deputy, Gordon Brown, a devout research man, knows his party's own surveys suggest Mrs Thatcher's policies enjoy continuing support. But with the first hints that some voters, especially those with mortgages, think she's gone too far. Brian Gould may run into trouble in trying to adjust Labour's industrial policy to what left-inclined intellectuals are calling post-Fordism. This latest buzzword means that the age of mass production is passing and that many people now work in smaller, often non-union enterprises. This theme may offend traditionalists. Robin Cook has to shape a credible policy on health, the government's most agonised subject, while Jack Cunningham will hope to exploit the unpopularity of poll tax. But Labour's thorniest subject remains defence. Gerald Kaufman's leading teams to other capitals in search of international opportunities to get his party off the hook of purely unilateral policies that have been unpopular with voters. Tonight, some were scornful about the left's challenge. They must have known that their candidates, whoever they were, uh, the dope test on them was going to prove positive. The leadership gets a new start tonight, but Neil Kinnock knows that unless his policy review raises Labour's poll standing in the next year, he may face another and more formidable challenge before the general election. On their last full day in orbit, the crew of the Space Shuttle Discovery have been remembering their seven colleagues killed in the Challenger disaster in January 1986. Mission Commander Frederick Hauck and his crew of four paid tribute to them from space. Discovery Houston, we're with you through Hawaii. Three days into the mission and Discovery was on its 49th orbit. As the shuttle passed over Hawaii, Commander Rick Hauck took this moment to remember the crew of the Challenger. Dear friends, we have resumed the journey that we promised to continue for you. Dear friends, your loss has meant that we could confidently begin anew. Dear friends, your spirit and your dream are still alive in our hearts. There followed this reply from Mission Control at Houston, Texas. Discovery, on behalf of the Challenger families and all of us down here, it sure does feel good to see the Challenger mission continue in America back in space. The five crew members had assembled on Discovery's mid-deck for a satellite news conference. They spoke of a near-trouble-free mission, pilot Dick Covey recalling his thoughts during the launch. It's really wonderful when we lift it off. Uh, it certainly was uh, a lot more uh, uh, anxiety-producing than we had anticipated, or at least I had. Uh, throughout uh, the entire ascent, uh, I had forgotten what it was like to accelerate at 3 Gs for a sustained period of time and uh, how helpless you really feel during that time period. Discovery has 24 hours left in orbit, but already it's completed its mission to give the Americans a new beginning in space and to put the Challenger disaster behind them. Welsh extremists say they carried out a series of firebomb attacks on estate agents' offices. They're opposed to English families buying second homes in Wales. Two bombs went off at Wellington in Shropshire. Another was found in a village in the Cotswolds. The offices were damaged in Merseyside, Cheshire, Worcestershire and Avon. The extremists had carried out similar attacks in Shrewsbury and Chester earlier this year. The body of a five-year-old boy who disappeared two weeks ago in Scotland has been found tonight. Stephen McCarran went missing from a holiday camp in Ayr. His body was found by a walker in the Carrick Hills. The Canadian sprinter Ben Johnson has spoken in public for the first time since he was stripped of his Olympic gold medal for drug taking. Johnson denied that he deliberately took a banned steroid and said he intended to clear his name. Ben Johnson was being honoured by a Canadian magazine as the number one sportsman of the year and he responded to an ovation of support. I just want to say uh, I never would do such things as... They said I did. So, uh, 
This was Johnson's first public denial of his guilt. Even, I don't have to run for two, two, two years, uh, I'll be able to come back and, and go to games and uh, hopefully when I do come back, it won't be any uh, weird in the end of the year. I'll be running my best race of my life and uh, hopefully I will second the fastest time ever recorded in the world. The Canadian medical authorities have announced an inquiry into the allegations denied by Johnson's doctor that the sprinter was given an injection containing steroids. Johnson has a new lawyer who will try to get him reinstated by the International Amateur Athletics Federation. By the time any inquiry is held and he is found innocent, as I'm sure he will be, he will have lost the opportunity of pursuing his career. Initially, on his return to Canada, Ben Johnson tried to remain hidden. Now he's begun to distance himself from those who used to counsel him and he's taken on a new set of advisors. The Olympics ended today with a spectacular ceremony in the stadium in Seoul. The Soviet Union topped the medal table, followed by East Germany, the United States and Korea. Britain came 12th with 24 medals. As Michael Peshart reports from Seoul, the controversy over drugs at times overshadowed the competition. No formal march past at the closing ceremony, there was the traditional mingling of the world's best athletes. As at Los Angeles, there were five gold medals for Britain. The only disappointment, the lack of a gold in the more glamorous athletics events. After the earnest days of competition, this was the Olympic spirit at its best. There was no sign of the much feared political disruption, but these games certainly weren't without blemish. One man more than any other has dominated these Olympics. Linford Christie, a fervent anti-drugs campaigner, so nearly went the same way. He didn't know it, but with traces of banned substances in some of his health foods, the Olympic Committee would have been well within their rights to ban him. What we can do, of course, is to be far more vigilant uh, than we have been in the past as to what uh, pills and health products and all the rest of it that people take in uh, competitive state in order to be healthier. A referee just took a punch from one of the Korean coaches. Then there was the unscheduled fighting in the boxing ring after a Korean lost a disputed decision. Only Western and particularly American television cameras concentrated on the event. The coverage annoyed the Koreans and intensified simmering anti-American feeling. Leave your calling card and take off right there. Ooh. The tension surfaced again even on the final day. An American boxer was fighting a Korean. The crowd was fiercely supportive of their boxer, but most were sure the American had won. Well, if he doesn't win the goal off this, then I think there's something rotten in Korea. Neutral observers were equally convinced of the winner, but the judges gave it to the Korean amid allegations of bribery. These games haven't been the huge financial success that Los Angeles was, but there will be a profit and most have enjoyed the experience. The Koreans believe they've put their country on the map. It'll be Barcelona's turn to impress in four years' time. Europe's richest horse race, the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe, was won today in Paris by the Italian horse Tony Bin. His jockey, John Reed, from Northern Ireland, held off a late challenge from the British favourite, Matoto, to take the first prize of five million francs. The result, Tony Bin first, Matoto second, and the French horse, Boyatino, third. Motor racing Alain Prost has won the Spanish Grand Prix to retain his lead in the Formula One World Championship. Britain's Nigel Mansell was second. Prost was first away, taking a lead which he kept for the entire race. He cruised home to take the chequered flag in his McLaren Honda, finishing 26 seconds ahead of Mansell in a Williams. Prost's McLaren teammate and main challenger, the Brazilian Ayrton Senna, was fourth. Prost stays at the top of the table, but the championship remains open. Desperate attempts are being made in Western Australia to save the lives of scores of whales which have come ashore south of Perth. The whales have repeatedly beached themselves near Augusta. Volunteers launched an overnight rescue operation to try to get them back into deep water. The battle to save the stranded whales has become a desperate race against time. 70 whales altogether beached themselves along five miles of coastline where rescue workers are frantically trying to keep them alive. They brought them ashore to prevent drowning and then used heavy equipment to gently lift the whales into trucks 
and ferry them 10 miles to a nearby sheltered bay. Overnight, in a remarkable operation, more than 1,000 volunteers waded waist-deep into the freezing water and in half-hour shifts stayed with the confused mammals, just holding them upright, helping them to regain buoyancy. The aim at daybreak was to guide the whales towards the open sea. Already, 30 of the whales had died, but those which had survived were suddenly gone. It seemed the rescue was a success, but an hour later, delight turned to disappointment as the whales beached themselves yet again a mile away. The witnesses that were standing on the beach when they came ashore uh, said that they saw the uh, pod milling behind the waves and then the two youngest calves broke away and came inshore. And when that occurred, the rest of the pod followed them in. I think it's uh, pretty disheartening when uh, people have worked so hard. There's a lot of very tired people here. and. Uh, to see them come in and uh, know that you've simply got to start again, but uh, they've made a pretty tough stuff, this, this mob, so uh, we'll get through. Finally, tonight's main news again. Mr Kinnock and Mr Hattersley have won the vote of confidence they wanted, re-elected by huge majorities at the Labour Party conference. Mr Kinnock says he now has a mandate for unity and change. From the newsroom, good night. Good evening. Well, after a very pleasant weekend for many of you, it looks like the good weather's now going out with the bathwater as these weather systems begin to get in off the Atlantic. And it's this one here, way out in the Atlantic, that's going to develop and spring some uh, rather wet and windy weather up across the country later on Tuesday and into Wednesday. Now, the satellite picture at 7 o'clock this evening shows some thicker cloud coming in from the west. So for much of Northern Ireland and Scotland tonight, it's going to be cloudy with further rain from time to time, the heaviest pulses of rain out here in western Scotland. An increasing cloud in the southeastern corner, but it should stay dry. In these central parts, they're turning misty with one or two fog patches later in the night. But it won't be as cold as it's been recently. The lowest about 5, and up in the north, nearer 10 or 11 degrees. So really quite a mild night up in the north tonight. So tomorrow then, starting off fairly cloudy over much of Northern Ireland and Scotland. But brighter conditions with some showers in the far northwest, gradually pushing southwards as the day goes along. The rain petering out, but getting back into northwest England and north Wales during the afternoon. The best of the weather tomorrow, probably from about Greater Manchester southwards through the Midlands, Wales and into the southwest. Some hazy sunshine for much of the day. But this is a problem area. The southeastern corner more cloudy than today, and there could be the odd shower. Temperatures about the same as today, 16 or 17, the low 60s Fahrenheit. That's it. Bye bye for now. The Broadcasting Complaints Commission has rejected a complaint of unfair treatment in an item in That's Life, broadcast on BBC One on 7th of February 1988, about the product Speed Slim, marketed by Toby Ward Limited. The company complained that comments in the item were unfair, inaccurate and not in the public interest. Moreover, the company said that item was based on inadequate research and that they were not given an opportunity to answer criticisms. The Commission concluded that the item focused on a product which clearly did not meet the advertised claims made for it, that the research was adequate, and that there was opportunity for Toby Ward Limited to put their views to That's Life. As part of a series in the campaign by That's Life to extend the Medicines Act to cover slimming aids, it was in the public interest and was not unfair in any respect. The Commission has not upheld the complaint. Copies of the full adjudication may be obtained by writing to the Broadcasting Complaints Commission, P.O. Box 333, London SW1W OBQ, enclosing a stamped-addressed envelope.